don't exit the doors before the flight lands. Um, I know that I should be wearing this, but uh, I'm not going to be able to that long, and I like the zoom lever effect of using a very tiny microphone. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, welcome to our uh, continuing biennial coverage. Um, uh, it's my pleasure this evening to welcome back to UIC Patrick Schumacher. Patrick studied architecture and philosophy, receiving his architectural diploma from the University of Stuttgart and a PhD from the University of Klagenfurt. He has been affiliated with Zaha Hadid Architects for an astounding 30 years, almost, since 1988. 1988? Yeah. I mean, I'm not the mask guy here. Um, and is currently the office's director and senior designer, overseeing all projects in the office with founding partner Zaha Hadid. From the Vitra Fire Station to the Sterling Prize winning Maxi Center in Rome and beyond, the awards, exhibitions, and publications of his work with ZHA, ZHA is too overwhelming to recount, but you are all aware of them, uh, I'm sure, or at least should be. Since 1996, he has been the co-director of the very influential design research lab at the AA in London, uh, is a tenured professor at Innsbruck University, and has also taught at Columbia, Harvard, and here at UIC. I think was a studio in the early 90s with Zaha Hadid when Stanley Tyron was the director. I think Catherine Ingram was the local person in the early 90s. Um, Patrick is also the author of the influential and controversial two-volume treatise, The Autopolisis of Architecture, uh, in addition to 2002's Latent Utopias, as well as a prolific body of work published from the research he has supervised at the AA's DRL, and which is a genre that subsequently spread from the AA to SIAR, Verlag, ETH, Delft, and indeed all schools of architecture that now promote the research foundation as a model. As controversial as the work of Patrick had, uh, as the work Patrick has overseen at Zaha Hadid Architects, what is amazing perhaps is that even more controversial is what he says about architecture in its current context of production and dissemination. He is relentless in putting his words where his forms are, and that in itself is a welcome alternative to the new politesse we find among architects too eager to please. He has taken on, quote, dismissive critics who denigrate stars and iconic works of architecture, arguing that one job of the critic is to communicate ideas, not foreclose them, which is a lesson that our own critic of the Chicago Tribune could also learn. Um, he's also attacked a misplaced political correctness in architecture, as well as the sloppy confusion of architecture and art. For all of these things, for taking on taboo topics and unfashionable positions, some of us at least are grateful. Patrick himself embodies a range of contradictions and paradoxes, a kind of walking debate of architecture himself, uh, an advocate of research who is known for writing manifestos, a student of Marxism who values forms of the free market, the promoter of a new systemic model of architecture who endorses individual talent, an intellectual rationalist in expressionist clothing. Even when you disagree with him, you have to admit he's at least half right. <laughs> Take parametricism, for example. We at least agree on the ism part. Um, there are very few individuals in architecture today who say and produce more experimental and outlandish things, and it's a loss to the field that there are not more of them. Patrick is our Nicholas Duran, Buckminster Fuller, and Charles Jenks all rolled into one. Please join me in welcoming the perfectly clear and always enigmatic Patrick Schumacher. So, and the IIT, so some of you like to see this happen. 
and that is the designation which become, becomes alive now. And that's why crowd modeling would be the right way to determine the meaning of that space. That substitutes for the label I will stick into the drawing. And it becomes more subtle because it's maybe a certain type of lecture with, with, with degrees of fluidity, openness, etc. That opens up. I can look at particulars, looking at the particulars of the crowd, maybe it's coming and going, uh, etc. Uh, in orientation, uh, uh, in, in one to many, or maybe later on it becomes, becomes a seminar in many, many etc. So these are different designations, and it keeps switching the label and maybe switching elements in the space. So what uh, I want to say here is that I use crowd modeling to become life process modeling, but it is the modeling of the meaning of space. So I have a few phrases here from uh, my treatise, the Society of Functional Architecture is a little bit ordering and framing of communicative interaction. Um, I'm saying basically um, <coughs> human society comes to life that through social cooperation and in the contemporary world it is clear that most of our interactions are communicative interactions. All our work is communication work and this kind of the whole city here is all about gathering and regathering different relevant partners and participants communication and in all the different scenario situations we might participate in through the day through the week and sorting all the individuals so that you can communicate relevantly with all the partners. Find each other in the evening, you find your social events and stuff. And uh, that needs to, needs to be somehow uh, structured and framed, like I called it. And that's the task of architecture. And that this is also uh, protecting us from wild animals and the, the, the cold and, and, and the rain and that this, uh, the, the, these frames are also have to withstand gravity. It's all engineering business and not the core competency in the sense of triviality for what we don't need in academic discipline of architecture. So, uh, but it's important here that these frames, let's say that space and its configuration, but also its place in a larger frame, and the place of the campus, or the school in a larger campus, etc., all this is a part of that communication. And uh, these uh, communications, like I say, uh, Find trends and find the community reflections that are expected to take place within the respective frame territory. So if you pass by here, but you grasp all this lecture hall, and uh, this is where, you, uh, where the people will be sitting, and I can anticipate the situation and can read off the situation from what I encounter in my visual field. So this space, empty already or half filled, is, communicates an invitation to join this lecture, and like any communication, you accept and join communicative interaction, or you kind of maybe negate and say, I don't have anything to do with you, you move on. So, like any communication, if somebody says hello and you ignore, or you say hello, yes, how can I help you? You start doing the same, this is, it, the same rule applies to the space, the space is invitation to, to join, you either come in. Once you do that, then you follow the rules of conduct which are inscribed, which are actually the message and instruction, the meaning of that space. And then we need this, we need to be all brought continuously wherever we are, whatever we do, we are always framed by architecture. Right? We are always somewhere, and that somewhere always gives us rules of conduct, and quite different out on the street, on the sidewalk, in a private courtyard, in a corridor, in a, in a, in a, in a loft. Everywhere we are, wherever we move, the situation is defined for us, we have been under the spell of a broadcast communication of the whole institution in place that tell us what to do. So, is that understood? Any disagreements on this? Puzzle? That's fundamental. I think that's key. That's what architecture is all about. In terms of the architect's task. We are in charge of what the sidewalk tells us tells its audiences. And uh, some other way else is, is, is in charge of that you don't sink into the sidewalk when you step on it. Um, yeah, so building is an instrument of construction human activity. And human activity is oh god. Um, 
communicate with the right? Even if you want to suddenly sit down somewhere on a part of park bench, that's a communication. It's depending on how you sit there, in the center, you know, I'm sitting here, nobody is supposed to be here, and you pull aside, and you know, you're take. Whatever you do, you communicate in a social space. <coughs> and, uh, but the bench also was already communication. It's a communication of the municipality, et cetera, as a communication. Um, so, <coughs> I need to move on. Let's look at the sociological underpinning of this uh, situation is a very important sociology because they frame every move and act and interaction. So, so um, <coughs> usually the communications which we encounter day by day. They're actually not, although we design them as architects, they're not our communications. Right? They're the client's communication, the host institution's communication. We attribute them them, and they're actually responsible for them. So, um, Walter Netsch designed this, but that's not, you know, what this communicated this as an architectural manifesto or something. No, in, in everyday life, it's the school communicates this. Presents itself with a certain demeanor, with a certain degree of openness, with a certain set of situational offerings, so the clients are the ones which communicate through us. We help them communicate this. Okay? And uh, so, to step back a little bit from the everyday and make this more profound, perhaps even. Uh, a the logic called on the inside, I would say that all social order requires spatial order. Society could function without um, the structuration work, which is done by the built environment. I'll say something like architecture requires a long term social memory as necessary substrate revolution. So let me first give you a that it does that. Uh, from the very beginning and still does it. If you imagine the center of Chicago with all its spaces and places. Well, let's go to well, maybe something that's less build up. It's, so it's not only it's, there's more quantity, it's a little bit. Let's say it's a kind of uh, suburban arena of, of Los Angeles where everything's relatively flat. 100,000, uh, a district of 100,000 people, and you wipe out all the architectural structuration and you make a gray rubber surface, very soft, very comfy. You have a beautiful weather, there's no issue of shelter, right? Uh, which I suppose the architecture is all about. And, you, and then you also need to, let's say, take the design around out, make that a gray surface. Uh, we all have to undress, we kind of make a 100,000 naked body thrown onto a gray, undifferentiated rubber surface. Right? There's no technical problem because it's nice weather, as Right, it's, there's no wind and so on. But what is, what is becomes obvious is that society breaks down right away because it's social structure, it's information processing of knowing who we are, where we are, who together, with what do we want to, uh, is totally broken down. What's our rules of conduct, or where we, you know, all these pages which bring us together are erased, so civilization collapses and we're within kind of in a few hours, we, we're going to resort to some kind of animal condition. That's what I want to do with my thesis in terms of what the true work of urban design, architectural design, and also you know, the fashion system, product design. And so on. so um, what I find remarkable is, you know, you you have kind of these flocks of apes. Which, which uh, roam around in the forest of Anna. they don't build up any stable settlement structures. So, a million years later, they're still the same kind of bunch of tapes that might be quite bright and brainy and, 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 and skillful, like chimpanzees and dolphins, etc. But there, there's something missing, which is the next 
step in the evolution, which is um, what I believe is that becoming human means building up social cooperation, societies of sorts, gain structure, and they can accrue and accumulate through having a new physical substrate of evolution. Now it's the cultural evolution and the evolution of human institution, which graft onto the physical built environment. And that kind of has the same role that the DNA has for biological evolution up to that point, because it is a substrate which allows for mutation, selection, reproduction, tinkering, trial and error, and growth and build up of societal structures. And it sorts the various players and figures into a kind of society. And, and it starts to stabilize and distribute places for routine interaction activities. It sorts people into social structures, with families and clans and uh, elders and, and adolescents and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, and that is necessary. That is what it means becoming human and becoming a routinized social structure which now can evolve and build up complexity and capacities. And so there isn't, there is no known human society which doesn't externalize and use the transformation of the environment as a social structuration machine and apparatus and an evolutionary substrate. But also what is very quite significant, so that there isn't any human society which without these kind of manipulations, also of these kind of naked bodies, they need to be started to be marked and differentiated into families, clans, uh, there's rites of passage from, from adolescents to, to elders, there's hierarchies which are inscribed. Because you, you need that to, to be reminded and to stabilize the structures because you wouldn't, you wouldn't, the information processing of a complex social structure requires these inscriptions. So that's why there isn't any human society without this. And if you look around, then this is still going on. Right? We still cannot survive without this. We need, you know, we still make enormous amounts of things, of course, male, female, uh, uh, kind of ages you want to participate. Of course, now we're not, it's self sorting. You know, you can see the difference between an artist, a business person, a scientist, I mean, all these professions that, you know, and of course it's very complex now because we have multiple roles and we have a huge wardrobe and different ways to, 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 to signal and, and, and project who we are and what mood we are or how outgoing or, or valencies of communication we have. We rely on this when we navigate the social world like this. We navigate the social world through this and we navigate the social world through these morphologies. And the, the, the kind of technical requirement of morphology in pure spatial only is enough. We also need that kind of graphic overlay, which is semi-logical overlay onto these physical structures, but the physical structures themselves are already also semiology. So the place where something is in the middle of the edge, in sequence or out of sequence, ha has meaning, like in a sentence. Flip flipping words is meaning. But also the color coding and graphic and, and, and iconographic. It's all at play. And we needed and we couldn't function without that. That's good. That's not just artistic play. That's absolutely necessary functionality of design. And that is all the design sense. Because what I'm saying that my discourse is claiming exclusive universal competency for, 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 the, for the discourse of design, for the totality of the built environment and the world of artifact, the totality of our man-made environment, which is now nearly 100% the environment to move it. Because lands, even trees and landscape is all landscape. Designed. Everything is designed. The totality of the phenomenal world is our responsibility collectively. We are in charge of this, and everything which is placed in our physical phenomenal world, including this body, there's a designer. So all these decisions go through the needle's eye of my discourse, our discourse. Who wants to step up to shape that? And now with the internet, you can shape and influence what's going on in world society in terms of physical presence with respect to the communicative aspects. Technical aspects, somebody else. But the communicative aspect is the essential and the form aspect is our challenge. So 
I have this I, uh, when we talk about the, the discipline of architecture, I'm calling the final result of the built environment, which is well structured for the purpose of social structuration and uh, communicative interaction, I call it architectural order, or architectural slash urban order. And there's this organizational aspect, this is where you put things, this kind of uh, distribution in space. What you do with the, with the, with the, with the, with the dive on top down, that's an important aspect. And we have to upgrade our repertoires. There's not only axes or grids, there's many other things, uh, or, or boxes and boxes. And then the next thing is the articulation of this to give that uh, articulatory overlay. It's not just where things are, what is, what is within what, and what is next to what, or away from what, but the morphology in which this is kind of becomes plastic, this articulation. And that has two elements again at the, at the back. The, uh, we have, when we work on this, we have to worry about the perceptual palpability of the unit's interaction uh, in terms of its cognitive tractability, but we also then have to worry about its um, signification in terms of the encoding process. Now, we usually as architects don't talk like this, think like this the first time you hear that broken down to you, but intuitively all architects are always already worried about these things. Oh, this doesn't look like an office, so we make it a sexual residential one. You know, we change its look, its appearance to make it recognizable, to affiliate with a certain coolness as well. You, you always work on the into a sociologically differentiated space. And you also worry about whether there's a clarity of composition, so you worry about phenomenology, you worry about semiology, whenever, whenever, you, whenever you work. But I say, we need to make an explicit project. Yep. And uh, we can upgrade our intuitive competency and make an explicit, uh, reflected, enhanced capacity. So this is the way I think the design project from the architectural designer's perspective as these three Sub project and then focusing in on the same project, project is at least a level. But in terms of, I said, the organization project also, we need to kind of, let's say, enhance our capacity to handle this, not just say, well, I know what to do, I'm just uh, putting one box next to another, or I have a grid and put a few things onto the grid. We need to be much more versatile and we need to uh, understand what it means uh, to organize. Uh, you know, capability maps. I mean, I don't want to, you know, the, the idea of complex intersections and infiltrations, uh, maybe also uh, more complex <coughs> ambiguous interpenetrations or subarticulations, sep sep uh, half quarter separations. And it's some kind of a logic, or we have fuzzy logics overlapping and bleeding uh, and gradient sets and subsets, these are all repertoires of organization. So we need to, let's say, I don't, we need to make an enhance our capacity with a kind of science of configuration or organization, just to expand our intelligent repertoire to, to use that dimension effectively. And we also need to um, worry about Particularly when we when we start to encounter more complex scenes, right? a very dense urban environment, how do I, uh, maybe a lot of things are there, a lot of things are distinct seemingly, but it, I can't comprehend that they become kind of white noise and they cancel each other out. So we need to also see how we are breaking down complex scenes and make them perceptually palpable. We're looking at the start grouping principles here, we're looking at the psychology of perception. We need you to reflect that. Because if I'm going beyond the composition with three or four volumes and a clear entrance or something, uh, then it's no longer trivial that actually uh, increase complexity that this becomes kind of legible or remains legible. So I'm interested in maintaining legibility in the arms of increased complexity. We need to see, for instance, these, you know, these are line, vertical lines, these are horizontal lines, so proximity uh, pulls things together through so contiguity, etc. You know, because we can't comprehend uh, 20 things at the same time. We need to break them down and chunk them into 
zeros of interaction. What is interesting here is that similarity helps you. So, so here we're actually looking at horizontal lines rather than vertical lines. Uh, although these are, if you go, go by contiguity, you see vertical lines. If you go by similarity, you see uh, horizontal lines. It's unfortunately distorted. If, if it wasn't distorted, it was clearer. So there's some of these principles of breaking down the kind of uh, intense uh, uh, field of sense data that should be confronted into, into objects, uh, it's kind of ob object constitution, gestalt constitution. So some of them might be conflicting. And you can use that and see circles here, you can see centers, and, uh, but they're not really physically kind of as contiguous objects present. I mean, we have the paradigm of object is a, is a contiguous element that you can pick up and move against the background. You know that this is one object, and this is a second one, and I can put them on the table, and it's clear because there, there's a number of elements, convexity, and, uh, but, but in architecture, where things, you can pick up things and shift them, where everything is kind of baked together, where's the individualization or individuation criterion becomes, you know, whatever you need. And it's never kind of 1,000 pixels. It's always figures. So the, 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 the reading of figures is an interesting thing to reflect on. And you might have seen those. So, so if you have, uh, so we go by proximity, we go by similarity, we go by smooth continuation. So if you have that figure here, most likely you, you would see these two lines. And you wouldn't see these or these kind of figures. But once I'm offering them, you can see, oh yeah, this could also be these two kind of kissing beacons. So we have two things. You can also see it, see it as a single gestalt. So that is smooth continuation trumps, or here you say that the convexity of an object helps us to dissolve this. It's a kind of, I call this when I go from an overall offering to the element, to breakdown. Uh, I call it a decomposition of the scene. So this would be the privileged decomposition of the scene, which we most probably go for, rather than saying 2K, a K and a mirror of K, or an M and a W. Even though these are quite familiar, and you can play with this. If I make a little gap here, and that's a parametric variation, I can flip the reading. I can, I can go from here to here, for instance. And that's interesting to me. So you can actually embed multiple readings of figures Essential organizations and essential then become messages and communications. You can kind of flip them over by slight reconfigurations or different lighting conditions and so on. But that is, you know, you know the void solid, what you're focusing on, what becomes a figure, what becomes a unit of interaction, what your attention. We go by symmetry. Symmetry is something we detect similarly, we integrate that into an into an object. So we see white shapes here, black shapes here. And uh, what is interesting about symmetry is that the more amorphous and irregular a figure, you can hardly see a figure, there's many, everybody starts to see something else in this, and it becomes fun if you have kind of Turkish coffee reading or a water pattern, because there's nothing there, and it's totally what everybody reads its own thing. But once I mirror that, it becomes a very powerful and striking presence of an object, which grabs our attention. So we, we see this as a unit of interaction, something we pay attention to. Whereas this one, we might just see some inconsequential, accidental gathering, which might break apart. It's nothing organic, nothing. No force, no essence, no, no power. So that's why this is sometimes. But it depends. The, it's the stronger the force, the more amorphous the pieces, because it's more improbable that this Symmetry was accidental. It must mean something. Whereas if you put just two cubes next to each other, their symmetry but it's far weaker. So another thing is this way. We, I think the contemporary city is a bit like this, right? This is kind of crazy dense layering of shapes and lights and shadow and um, you know the impressionists were fascinated with the cubists and so on. How do you actually what you know that's painting, what is it depicting? And uh, if I give you a hint, it's a kind of top-down process, like Picasso, a woman with a guitar, you kind of might see something, you might look for something. 
in that, but also if I give you this, you can kind of, but if you've seen a proper woman with a guitar here, then you look this, it becomes quite quickly a right graph, you move on to there, you still see the woman with the guitar, now you see it. So there's also this, where you're coming from, what you've seen before, allows you to see something here. So there's a priming. There's, these are all different effects we should be kind of aware of when we design and utilize to charge up our complex uh, visual field in terms of its phenologically, phenological um, tractability, palpability, etc. These things are also interesting me. So we work with color and of course with contrast and we have to distinct, distinguish zones and subzones. I also want to make things similar across it's interesting that it depends on the context. I mean, this is something we, these are the same dots, right? So there is context dependency on identity, even on whether something is differentiated or undifferentiated. Um, and that's something to play with active. Uh, maybe on most conditions, and you switch, comp, you switch comp background, you can draw them together, you can distinguish them. That's also this. So color is. There's very little objective, there's nothing object, objective in the phenomenal world of the city, right? There's no objective color, there's no objective cool lightness, it's all depending on what else is there around. There's actually no object, objects which are kind of pre-given because, as I said earlier, what, how that flurry of impressions, facet, edges, lines, angles, you name it, even that naming a line, you can't name a line because naming the line is 100 little Dots, right? So there's nothing given. It's always a synthesis, an act of synthesis on, on behalf of the user participant. And that depends on what the participant is looking for, what he's, what he's trying to do, and that he's reading certain aspects. So it's always a reading, always subjective. But these subjectivities follow certain gestalt ordering principles which are invariants across all. Human cognitive agents. So that's what we need to get into when we're starting to work in a very complex built environment. And we can also use these, you know, object parameters on the one hand, which but the object itself is constituted, but there's also observer parameters. We need to look at where am I looking for? Where I put my camera, that gives me a total different way of what belongs together, what Disassociate or associate into a figure. And these kind of land art pieces which, which, which show this, right? So, at a certain perspective and a certain axis, these things come together, and in other observer positions, they, they break apart. So, there's an observer dependency also in terms of position, but there's also an observer dependency in any way with respect to um, ambient parameters like, like uh, lighting, context parameters, and this whole kind of like start grouping synthesis, which is an act of um, So we play with this with some of our architectural experiments. So this is a, a grid. And this is purely changing camera position, observer position. You can turn something into a circle packing, into a grid, into a wave pattern. And that means also you can see here it depends whether you, this was originally also homogeneous, unified, and now it's differentiated with an articulated center, so it's topologically transformed through a perspectival condition. And you can also do that. Here it seems in the top view, and there's no way, there's no, there's no need to privilege the top view in any way. There's always a meaning, and you can see here that we can to start with a seeming circle packing and then turn it into a grid, undifferentiated grid, and put it away from it. And uh, so nothing is objective. It's always observer position dependent. So you need to, we can't just say, I've designed this. You've designed what, from what perspective, under what lighting conditions, with, through, for whose eyes, with what he's seen before. What is able to grasp? So it's, you know, it's, it's a little more complex. Now the illusion is that you wanted to draw a rectangle, etc. Uh, 
right? And I do think therefore it is the rectangle. That's delusional. Or that now we have the software, you, you, you have a certain history of building up a complex object. You started with a cube and then you bunched up. So that makes, gives you the illusion that there's a kind of objectivity to it. You have to withdraw from this and understand it's an open field. And also whether things move or you move or what they are and how they change, you know, change shape. Is this, this is something which serves in front of you. Uh, it's not only, yeah, it's, 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 it has a seeming movement going on, but it also keeps changing its decomposition. It's, what is the composition? The composition of six blobs, of three waves, of, what is it? It's, it's, it's all of these things, and that's powerful, right? So, because now you can embed more offerings, more frames in the environment, and that becomes an information richer environment, which can be calibrated, recalibrated for multiple audience with share space, which operates simultaneously or in sequence in such things. You can enhance this with color. Well, this is purely light. I play light against this object. So ambient parameters. Yeah. Object parameters, ambient parameters, observer parameters, and all their parametric variability, and they and they keep changing the, the, the configuration, the composition, what's there, what's not there, what what it belongs to, what associates, and what is distinct. That keeps moving, keeps changing potentially, and therefore the messages, the communications, keep keeping, keep changing, recalibrating, and that's powerful. And you don't need to kind of shift heavy gear to change the spatial. Because we're no longer physically structured, right? This is not even a physically enclosed space, it's just frames. It's just the mental frame which says us who belongs here and who doesn't, right? And uh, we're not physically caged. The built environment is very open and porous. It's always semiological threshold, coded messages which structure us. It's not because we're physically in prison and the door is locked, that's why I'm there. I, I notice I'm there because I'm at thresholds, edges, they're, all, they're never physical, they're always messages. Uh, in a way, that count. In a, and you can do much more complex, and that's very important because if you, if you had to do it physically enforce all these structures, you would have very, very simplistic cellular organizations, and contemporary society must allow for far more freedom and relying on that self sorting according to readings rather than a kind of physical channeling like cattle through a kind of um, so, and what is important here that we, there's this kind of responsive environment, interaction, and we assume that these agents read the world, gather the world, and understand what through the conduct, it's enhanced and correlated for ceiling transformations, etc. Messages could be varied. And then the first hint, and this is worked from about 15 years ago. Um, of these kind of agent-based models that, that um, one could get a handle on the more contemporary condition where you say uh, the program domain, so parametrism has a whole new repertoires and techniques and, and forms that it has, but it is also a new conception of what a program is. It's not a schedule of combination of five stereotypical categories. Each of these categories has you know, variants uh, if they are parametrically variable event scenarios, which are calibrated, depends on how many and what dynamic, how stable, unstable, how. So, so, so that you only get a handle on these more complex institutional processes if you start modeling them. And I'm having a research project which I'm starting to develop to make to bring that out of the domain of kind of student experiment into the real domain with Bill Hubbard Smart uh, modeling team. And we can have all these tools now. We can, we can measure lighting, uh, light shadow, and you can imagine that this has temperature gradients, and that you can also imagine that people that are reading this, these courtyards, they will shift into the sun or into the shadow, so you can, you can play with this. It's all part of a structuration. Process. You can overlay now uh, the, the light shadow map 
and let the crowds respond to it. My crowds, the crowds we're developing in time, semiological crowds. That's an, a true and radical innovation for all crowd modeling. And they are loving it. Because they, they see that they can generalize out of evacuation, evacuation and circulation scenario where these crowd modeling are just purely like cattle physically channeling and pushing like liquids through, through channels. They, they can make them sensitive to thresholds, to meanings, to distance messages, to an understanding whether they are in public, private, semi-private spaces, which, which uh, changes. So I'm saying by now, once we know, once we have, we know that, we understand that, uh, what I said earlier, what the true core competency in essence of architecture is in terms of its communication, its framing of communicative action, what clients demand, why they invest in, in, in buildings for institutional processes, we need to work on that, and we can. And since we now can, not to do this is kind of intellectually no longer respectable. I mean, it's new to a lot of people, but it should be intellectually no longer respectable, quite soon. And I'm saying that the model without the crowd is no longer an architectural model. It might be a structural engineering model, it might be a normal model to measure up uh, Q, uh, for, for, for the quantity surveyor, you know, what the cost might be. There's going to be many things in the model. An empty model, I would say, is no longer an architectural model. Because you, as architects, that's what we are in charge with all that other stuff, engineering stuff. We are in charge of understanding and creating frames which, which invite, gather, structure, order, cajole, inspire, and they become responsive. The interaction process, that's what we need, and that's what the client wants. That's all the client ultimately cares for, right? He cares on these processes which are productive. I mean, this might be working environment. Or retail environment, which needs to kind of bring buyers and sellers together, and so the, you know, all parties are satisfied with the interaction uh, scenario which, which, is, which, is, which is designated. So, okay. Uh, questions at that point? Worries, comments? Yeah, are you talking about actual crowd simulation with agents with destinations and various things that influence form? Or are you talking about uh, that the form influences their destination of the behavior? Well, it's the same thing. I mean, I'm, we're actually having agent based models. Um, and we should throw them. If we do, if you do bubble diagram, right? Two D on your drawing, throw sort of splines around or something, you know, or if you color grade into this, you should have crowds in there. I think with the, with the way I believe we now start designing is we give a task to design a, a corporate office environment for 500 members of staff structured into various types and so on, and then the 100 business per day. Throw these 600 dots into this modeling space. And now the whole time, it's all about what these dots are doing, where they end up being, how they sort themselves, sort of move and, and gather. And so That's what you should be looking at. And then you draw a line and say, these, uh, and you make that, then you make a gap in the line and things push through. That's what should always be the model. From the bubble diagram with dots all the way to the final rendering, where you really have character, I mean, still agent based one, somebody moving down the street there, in a certain way, with a certain nuance, because that's what the space is for, and that's what is signaled by the light level, by the nuance you give the bounciness of the of the uh, of, of, of the floor and the softness of the of the sofa. The, the most nuanced sociological, emotional meaning and what the, the host will see fits the host's offering can be the model. The nth degree and then at the time it has to be coincided with the, the, the texture uh, rendered of of this carpet as it were because that that's the message that corresponds, that's effective. So I'm going all the way through this, but the agents are always there. And they're always the essence of what we're working on because there's nothing else you can care about. You're not fetishes into kind of uh, uh, a, a carpet for its own sake and it's beauty it's the beauty of that encounter. Right? It's, it's the fertility the, the, the the sociological and, and communicative fertility of, of, of the scenario and event in the space and what it facilitates. Uh, that's what we into. That's why it should always be there. And, and I think that's going to be a new global best practice requirement. I just haven't pushed it out yet. So yeah, that's ideal, right? Like, I, you know, so right now you just have you to. You can imagine from a platform of view or any or, or the political space in which 
also a political plan would, would want, it, want you to kind of engage and convince them, this would be totally competitive. Sure. That's what you would want. Good one. Um, you have the what you do. We throw the crowds in, and the crowds will have um, behaviors which are given in the sense because we know that the client wants to create a bar for young, and the, we know that is what the, what the behaviors would be. So we need to. And what the mix might be and so on. So, so we, we, we put the crowds in. Of course, we need to script them realistically. And we, uh, we, 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 but we're working on the, the wall. We're working on the walls. We're working. we're working on the lines, the gaps, the entrance, the, the separated. We're working on all this stuff, but looking at the crowds. Because we're doing all this only so that the crowds are doing what they should be doing. Right? But we then also, and that's a new element, so we can work on this tradition. We're only working with fixed elements and the, the crowds are presumed but we we give the crowds crowds a sense not only that they are not walking through walls but that they're actually responding to, to color code information a kind of texture code information a kind of perceptually more likely the, you know the kind of the curvilinear path or something where they read and know where they're going whereas the, something which breaks on the corners they will be slower and will be certain spec on one way. So, so, so we need to be realistic in the cross when we work on the architectural elements. We are architects, right? But with now a very clear purpose uh, and a very clear set of criteria of success, which I can also read out of the model. Dwell times, um, you know, uh, assuredness of, of reaching destinations, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, encounter frequencies. These are the criteria in the end. We can we can also measure off the market. But we keep looking back, and we can also think, you know, what are the tools and um, yeah. So that will be it. But there's the other stage which we'll come to. But we can also now with augmented response environments make the the, the, the walls in real responsive to the crowd. If the, if the crowd builds up, maybe the walls push and give it more space. Or if the crowd is small, it's not maybe the walls come in to make it more intimate. There's also the you know the monitoring and cajoling of interaction scenarios to to, 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 to make it more happy and more people happy and engaging and satisfying. So there's a sponsor environment. And you can also try, you know, yeah, but I think in terms of the design process, it's not general in the sense that the crowd, you give the crowd something and the walls kind of follow the crowds, because the crowds are only doing something because of the walls. So the walls come. Oh, there's always some structuration in there. So it's not, you know, if you make an empty space without anything, then maybe they're just dispersing to the, to the edge of the uh, modeling space. There's always something. Attractors, repellers, uh, whatever. Uh, the, you know, differential uh, permeability or ease. So if you put steps in one direction and not in the other, then maybe there's a more high likelihood that crowds keep moving this, this or that direction. So, so yeah, is that clear? You, 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 you work on the architecture and look at the clouds. Yeah? So you've done a lot of very interesting optical illusions that are meaningful to us because we're smart, we have very powerful brains that can do a lot of uh, you know, spatial imagery analysis. But then the agent-based modeling, those don't, the computers can't really understand these occlusions the same way we can. So when you're creating these complex topologies, the agents aren't going to respond to that in a meaningful way. So how can you still use crowd-based modeling to achieve any realistic human simulation? Um, so what is first of all what what, what was for me was an epiphany many years ago when I first encountered crowd modeling is that with how with how simple a set of local rules you can simulate emerging global crowd behaviors, right? Uh, and that is purely signaling on walls and the walls, and mutual avoidance, like these frogs. 
uh, a, a distance, uh, minimum distance, maximum distance, and that becomes more sophisticated. Density dependent. If it's already a bit crowded, you, you tolerate somebody close to you. If it's empty and somebody comes close to you, it's like so. Th there's some of this availability to this, and it's amazing how much you can generate uh, conditions already. Very simple models on the on the circulatory behavior. For instance, you have you have a cord, you have two cords coming in, there will be symmetry breaking into a level of flow, either this way or this way. If you put a narrow point in there, you will have a breaking into time using to order this. You have stop and go waves, and so all these are known, very known phenomena. So they the next, and, and now, when it comes to understanding well, the phenological breakdown, there I can't, at the moment, let the agent run this. So that's where I intuitively give them the capacity and then let them behave accordingly. The same as surgical encoding, the language. I need to give them the information um, to make that realistic. That's a separate check. But although the only crowd monitors also have integrated some kind of ISO list, they can compute the perspective of the point and see if, if it's crowded, if it builds up or not. So there's minimal amount of even of perceptual analytics embedded in the, in the crowd. Right? So, so it, but we also have to be economic about this. We can't let, you know, simulate the whole human intelligence into this. But it's also interesting how, you know, how much simple rules you can go get already quite realistic in front. So, let me maybe go with a few more points. I wanted to show you, uh, a lot of times uh, people don't understand why we use curves. We just like them, we want to be exuberant, we want to be, uh, you say, expressive and rationality. I'm, you know, that there's a tension there. For me, everything is to be instrumentalized right, to be rationalized. So if I'm using curves, even if they intuitively drawn to a curve, I'm asking myself, why? It must be an advantage to this. So, you know, I trust these intuitions. Intuitions are information processing. Right? But I also want to pin down the analytically, pin down analytically the advantages. And then in the end, it's rationalized. And no longer, in that sense of, I just want to express my feelings, I just like that, and so on. We have to overcome that. We have to trust our instincts and aesthetic sensibilities. We also have to expand them and relearn them. But somebody else, at some point, we kind of critically reflect on them and analytically penetrate them, and then we can allow ourselves to further trust them. So, for instance, here, when I mean, I'm talking about information rich environments, I'm comparing now how you can, how far you get with the kind of minimalist repertoire, modernist repertoire of boxes and boxes and boxes, although this is already going beyond, this is now interpenetrating boxes. You know, more, uh, overlapping the range of competency, we, this is more building up more complexity, not only two spaces next to each other, but now you have shifts into each other, you have, you, know, you still have this somehow there, this is still there, in the top view anyway. You have a new space, a third space here, you have an L shape here, and you have this rectangle. So there's many more things. There were two, we just shifted, and now you have many more things. Now, but if you go in with curves, when you put a third one in, so many more things are happening, and you see them all simultaneously being present. If they're not physically walls all the way to the ceiling, if they're, one, if, if they're all just relief and floor, and there's like the Mies Butler or whatever it has this, right? It uses the, the roof as one rectangle. The wall pulls away and makes another one. The splints makes potentially another one. So you get all these inter overlapping conditions and you can create that where, where these are not just these uh, cellular segments, but where the presence, if that was for instance the roof floating over the splints, they can be both there and there's the overlap between the two. Right? That's very potent and powerful. Uh, wasn't much used in the generic organism. But what I'm going to uh, introduce is something, let's say it is small, it, it, it is close. And I'm, now, if it is a closed space, I don't understand anymore that the information I had before, that this is generated through the intersection of three volumes, that's an edit, since at the intersection of three territories, and belongs to all of them as it's kind of is, is lost. So we, we lose the information. And it seems to put as well be an autonomous individual thing. Right? So I compare this with, with if I'm working with curves. Now here I have it over let's assume this is segmenting with full walls. I have 
that space, but the information how the space was generated is maintained. So I call this space information rich. Right? It has its own identity here, and I can see here that wall and extrapolate as I know that this space is the intersection of a large or a circle of a certain size and it lives in a certain direction. That's the superiority of curvature. Put the third one in, you can trace that as well. So, in the end, this shape is a more complex shape, it's information richer. You know more about what's beyond the edges and where you are, not just in that space A. When before in the, in the rectangle, you were only in the space A. So, that's the privilege. And this also you can see here, things are changing, right? In but B on the left side is not changing, it doesn't participate in that, so it's insensitive to this. Whereas B on the right side is sensitive to this. Now, so on the right is the repertoire of parametrism, is the repertoire of minimalism. Now, when we apply color, we always use gradients, we scripts, and so on. Right? So, this is the better way to put color than just this is, a, this is gray, I'm not sure you can see that, it doesn't come through here. This is now a gray segment. This is a better way because it has more information. It shows me the center and it's please off the center. So it, 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 I, can, I can actually, without seeing the walls, I can, like a myopic bacteria, navigate along the, like bacteria moving in the pit tradition, along the nutrition gradient, it finds the best in me. And we can use color gradients, light gradients, or any kind of gradients as navigation to this information. Every, for me, all the visual things we design and so on are potential information. I mean to create a language out of this. Information is inference potential. That means I know more, I'm more with it, I know what to do next, I'm not lost. I got I mean, my capacity to interact with an answer and we need to be like on the ball. We right? do 150 things per week. And if you run down empty corridors and, and, and are sliced off in, in segregated uh, uh, streets and floors, you, just going to waste time, waste energy, and, and communication from potential flaws. Also, what I realized is you have this kind of deconstructivist technique of interpenetrating and layering, it's great, but it, it's, it becomes quite quickly more chaotic, and these are much more tractable and palpable, right? So if you put more in, it becomes the units of interaction just kind of breaks down into a kind of mess of splinters here, where this remains much more tractable. And these shapes have more figure, and this is amorphous, and this has more figure, and has the memory of what it's coming from. And if I push a trajectory through, we would do it like this way, and it's much more easy to follow. Remember smooth continuation, remember gestalt, convexity as, as, as a body, which is easier to grasp. Corners are always potentials where their figures disintegrate. So that's, for me, a little demonstration in very simple terms. And I know it has the superiority of the repertoires of parametrism in terms of articulating complexity and maintaining legibility and information richness in the face of complexity. Where here we, we, we kind of mostly lost in a, in, in, in a chaos with, with, with no, no, no much influence potential. So, uh, and we like that. This is prettier. Why do we like it? It's prettier. Because we somehow know that we can navigate and follow it. I think our intuitions or what we like are also to do what we understand to be life and answer. We navigate the world aesthetically because we don't have time each time to analyze the pros and cons and calculate advantages. We just go by gut reaction. We kind of condition and train and you look at a, a certain district or place or person the way he's dressed up and say, hey, not, with this, not here, not with this person. We got to do that. And that's aesthetic. That's what we navigate. It's incredibly important. We don't need to, and I trust that. But we need to also we learn uh, to navigate the world aesthetically. And now we, as architects, are totally in charge of creating this aesthetic matrix where we, people want to self-sort and roam and navigate and find relevant and important and meaningful parts of communication. If you didn't understand the scene, you end up in the wrong bar and there's Bought to with all the other bits to waste another day, or you even run the risk of being beaten up because, you know, I mean, if you had, didn't have all these signals, you would just stumble and waste your, your time after months and, and 
such a kind of mute and disarticulate world, you, you kind of waste away. Right? So we, we absolutely require that. And that's why our buildings look like that. <laughs> and, but it's also intense information rich because we have a simultaneity of choices now ordered into a space. And the series of strata and you so you also encompass above, below, and all around the building environment is nothing but a 360 degree interface of communication or offerings of understandings. It has law, order, smooth continuation, etc. etc. All the advantages that we're talking about are there and there is so much that comes into view, but it's not kind of a menacing, crowding out situation. And it's beautiful and uplifting. And uh, if you move from exterior to interior, there's coherency of law, of rule. You follow, you often use natural light to, to, to follow trajectories, etc. etc. So we articulate the paths, the different distinctions. There's a certain distinction of retail up to here, offices up to here. This is this kind of world of small startup companies. You need to be uh, a very intense social space. And it's not kind of the kind of artistic expression that you just want to do this kind of sculpture. This is high performance architecture. Now I want to give another demonstration how this works and what it means to articulate against the background of disarticulation. So this is what the world is in books now, right? It's engineering, utilitarian placement of objects and so on. There's stuff there which might be of the right size. But it's impossible to find yourself here. You need GPS, right? You have no idea what's going on with you. And we, we hate these arenas because they are identityless, they have they're disarticulated because now we're gonna waste time. And there's no, no character, no you know, nothing, it's all indistinct. Uh, it's, it's just horrible, right? Now now we into this horrible arena we ask to do something which potentially under normal circumstances a terrible thing. A uh, park and ride, you know, bus terminal, uh, tram station, a car park. Even the car park was kind of we had this patch across the road, another patch here, it's like here's another. It's, imagine, I mean, how, how disarticulate and, and horrendous a scene and dysfunctional scene you would usually come up with unless you enhance your repertoire. You know that the artistic project will become an actual instrumental project. So, what we're doing here, we have a graphic space, a series of moves which tie these things together and create gestalt, which take figures. Units of interaction where we see, read and see what belongs together, how to move food and how to get where one is. So basically, this is the car park. So what we've done here is, with that element we, and this curve, we unify the two car parks with the inlay of concrete. We unified again the two car parks and unified it with the roof, floor and roof coming here, and where the bus cuts in from here, where the tram cuts in from here, and where the car parks here. And it all makes sense that the figure has orientation, has meaning, and, and it, it is a, every pragmatic element you need is there. The communication lines, the light posts, the columns, the benches, the tracks. Everything is taken, becomes a pattern of an artistic project, I call it for now, but it's actually an articulation project, where everything becomes part of a compositional thrust. It's a radical formalism which is imposed super formalistic to bring everything under a ruthless formalism, but that makes it super functional because it doesn't compromise the light post and see that it's part of a field and array which thrusts itself and transforms into columns. And the demarcations of the of the floor become slots and light slots in the in the roof so that not only the concrete pushes through but these, these swarms push through and in. And uh, so everything becomes a graphically enhanced thing. Uh, the, 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 the lines, the location for the cars, the light posts, the curvature, there is an affiliation morphologically of these lines with shadows and things. So everything becomes this kind of thrusting field. You just you don't even have to think. You just end up where you want to be. That's nearly an, and when the cars are parked there, they're just enhanced because they become a kind of thrusting swarm of, of cars, which mostly are more dense to, towards the point where you want to be because they're parking there first and there's a kind of gradient swarm, a parametricist composition which works at night, which these 
light posts. They start low and grow and grow and grow, draw you, and you, you, you move up the nutrition gradient of height, and then they transform into columns, and the lines move up, and you have to try where you want to be. You didn't even know how to do that. So that's where my message is here. This, the, 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 the instrumentalization of the appearance, if you, if, you, if you know how to do it, you will deliver life enhancing uh, power of design. Question? You're all convinced I like it. Let me just go through. These are the kind of phrases which tag on people, and by now you understand it. There's also, I mean, and everything becomes a new repertoire of articulation. So, all these things were instrumental. We needed the light post for lighting, we needed the card for the mechanic. But every element has a second task to guide us, to tell us, to communicate to us. This chair physically holds you up, and it's a certain material, so if your ass doesn't freeze. That's one, it's physical uh, uh, engineering message, and it doesn't, you know, but it's also the invitation to place and ordering of a structure and communication, and that we all already look at is delivered by that. That's the architectural part. Yeah. So everything, everything will be utilized. Uh, and for instance, when you have to put windows in for lighting, they become also a layer of texture, of articulating, of filiation, what belongs to stuff you know, or environmental shading elements like the, the which, 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 you know, is just to, to, this building looks different from different sides because of the shading and so on. But also this character orientation, now I can, it makes the built environment more rich. I know where, where north, south, east, west is, when these towers take on these shades. So it orients me. While it shades, it also orients. And the shading bit is something we collaborate with the, with the, with the, with the environmental engineers, and they are part of the response to that the sufficient shading is delivered. And we are instrumentalizing for the articulation part. That's our part. And therefore, you know, but since we, we haven't learned to understand our true rational contribution, when we want to be rational about our work, we always back into engineering talk. So most architects who want to give reasons for the work, they actually give engineers reasons. They don't know the reason. They don't know the true reasons. Because when they think about their form intuitively, they haven't made it explicit. They don't know why this is what they're doing. So they left not to engineering. But I'm saying we need to instrumentalize and operationalize and analytically penetrate the true core competency of our, what would have been otherwise an intuitive, intuitive artistic kind of handling of, of the built environment and make that uh, a rational design. This is here you have a navigation space where light guides you, the movers, and you know that you this leads you to the tower, you later on gonna take the elevator in that navigation void so that when you move up you see all the levels. And then this is tied together into one trajectory that is important. You see already where you're going and that these the, the the, the morphological affiliation between these movers and the vertical movers that this ties together might have an intuition you would have done anyway. But I'm telling you why it would, because it's then much more easier to follow the trajectory. And if you switch it to horizontal, then it is less easy to make this connection. Right? And then it makes many other connections. And we like that, we like this is a built project. So, of course, when we are the first ones to do this, we initially become conspicuous. Right? And we are told that, oh, you're just doing icons, you want to kind of show off, and no. This is an inevitable initial conspicuity, a default condition of somebody who has new principles and rigors. But I believe that if this becomes global best practice, and it's compelling enough that this should happen, then this is, wouldn't be so conspicuous. And all buildings around you have kind of organic forms and you do something different. It's not this one thing sticking out against the radical background. We want to be incredibly embedded and make connections and be part of continuous fields with our projects. The temporary condition is, yes, they become conspicuous, they, they, they show off. And the, our buildings share a lot of this kind of organic dynamics, organic articulation, but they're also radically different in, 
know, these two projects are very, very, very different. More different between, within our earth than between the differences which, which exist in architecture now in the minimalist and modernist universe. Right? We have in our earth so much more difference than in the whole city of Chicago. But then we look at, oh, we're doing everything the same, because our things are always going to be conspicuous. That's this other thing, this organic thing, you can recognize it. But that doesn't mean that it's the same as it's actually the huge universe of creative proliferation of differences, but they connect and tie to each other. So this, you saw this, and it, it goes on, this tower, which is very complexly embedded in multiple conditions, a tower where you can, where you can pop out in different terraces to move, where you have that several atria to, to connect. It's a new kind of tower. It's an internally communicated tower, tower simultaneously. We don't like one of those conditions where we slice everything in separate cells and they're blind to each other. We want to be inter-aware. Where we are, we want to know what's going on, what's moving out, who is, what's happening below, above, and all around. And this is what we do from, from the inside through the outside, back to the inside, but then also all this convexity, concavity, this, this intersection, the slicing, these trajectories, uh, that's, that's our work. Graphic inscriptions, which tie things together into a, a kind of thing where you, the dream is this, that you kind of move through this because you subliminally process all these things, not the deciphering, it's a subliminal processing, it's like you're homing in on where you want it to go, it's like a kind of um, an animal kind of finding its prey because it's just navigating the lawful logic and differential logic of the building of, of the natural environment. There you have it. It's not this kind of scatter of random interventions. The natural environments have where the river comes, the topography, the forests grow more in the south, west, and the north, and they peter out, and then the, the animals sit in with their own laws, so everything is lawfully connected, everything is parametrically in a kind of associated model, interarticulated, that's, you know, nature of a parametric model, that's what we have to play with. So this is the kind of thing I want this, you know, uh, an interior just sketched out, an internal urbanism where you see hundreds and hundreds of things going on and you might want to participate in, and, but uh, it's not meant as in the structure or the data and, and life then you've made also these things become interactive, like maybe you were hinting at. It's not only that that um, uh, space and multiple systems frame the interaction, the various subsystems interact with each other and might be also responsive to, to users. So we're creating it, and, but this is the reality we're now facing and out there. This is garbage still. I mean, it's incredibly intense and rich. And a lot of things are there, and there's, there's hidden synergies, but they're disarticulated, menacing, not navigable. And, that's, and this was even less navigable to some extent, it was also it didn't have all these riches. But when, I, when you look at the city like this, this amorphous spill and, and, and structure, the only thing which gives shape, structure, gestalt, figure, navigability is the natural elements, because they have laws and forces. And, which shape them like all of the kind of forms. They're the only thing you can go by. The rest is just crazy. Money. That's, these, become, these become models of our cities. Everything is script based, everything is lawful. So you can start, you can also give me any amount of this articulate context, and I can tie it in, I can affiliate and pick up things and draw them into forms, which then gradually change. So the norm is differentiation. And rich is a marriage, and a new figure which ties into the existing. Rather than, uh, and, and this will give kind of modern this now, they make all the other layers, whether it's roads, and fenestration, and shading, and the color, they will all be kind of subsystems, they will be scripted in, they will all be like a new species uh, according to its own creative invented, unpredictable script, you know, like the moths going onto the rock certain places, certain rhythms, inviting the next person coming in. That's the way we build up the complexity of our models. And these are all scripted. Uh, if you take topography, some different subset, and you 
There's certain rules in which you populate this, and then you try another one, another one, another one, and you test whether this is kind of phenomenologically tractable. That's we can't yet operationalize. We could develop software so which try to stimulate the you know, we have pattern recognition software, so that we don't have those, but you could. But I think here at the moment humans are very, very good at that stuff. And you need to have that intuitive testing. Uh, whether these things are in the swarms of buildings, you can see uh, there's, all, there's, there's a series of negative, there's a negative swarm embedded in a positive swarm. And this negative swarm is maybe all the public and retail spaces. And the positive swarm is all the, all the, all the uh, private spaces. And you can see what we're doing with streets. The, all the patterns there, they can super finely filigrated, pedestrian, bicycles, all that, they're, they're ramified out. I mean, everything could be rethought and re, re, redone, and you can see that there's, there's a lot of intricacy and variability in here. And we haven't even put material and, 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 and color and all the other things, but everything will be stripped from top of over. <coughs> So what is interesting about this, I can show work, which is now by now maybe 15 years old. It doesn't matter. It's, yeah, yeah, you know, this is a very, very coherent research and design and development project where these things remain stable, the visions, the techniques, the insights, and by now, at that time, we didn't have structures, now we're using sophisticated structure, structuration, the skeleton, the structure would be inscribed. With engineering logics, with evolutionary algorithms and so on, the fenestration, environmental, all this wasn't there. It was just pure massing models, right? But the massing model, the kind of massing model and its agenda stands. And so it's a long mature research paradigm, not a kind of fashionable blip of an agenda and style which we could get bored of and move on back to maybe postmodernism. <laughs> Back to neo-rationalism, back to minimalism, back to no. This is the, this is the project. There is no other project in town. Simply speaking, I mean, if you, if, you, if you grasp it, you run with it. Problems is not so easy to grasp. There's so much disinformation and confusion and prejudice. I mean, I've written a tweet of 1,200 words, but all my critics have, have never turned a page. <laughs> so, and I uh, haven't written this lecture. So this is the kind of we've been doing this for years. Tracking and tracing the topography, but then have its own agenda of poking forth to, to, for views, etc. Embedding and integrating lots of existing grains. Um, there's a lot of stories to tell about this. Um, and environmental conditions, you know, bring them in, bring them on, and, but they also make this kind of thing very, very unique, unique identity, unique legibility, and. Um, oops, wait. Now, what I do now, I just show you some of those, 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 those little experiments to give you a glimpse of how this works. And then we open up the computer. Climatic so the meaning of all this in dense and intertitular stuff. That's just there. Now we bring in the meaning, that's the crowds which read these spaces, which gather and flow through them and, and, and stay. So, this is technical engineering cards. They just shot through like, uh, they don't care about color, shape, they just shot through gaps in the void walls. And you can do that. It's very compelling. Right? And, but I want to go here. I want to model this. I want to see these tables as attractors for maybe a certain one or another. And they're, they're guests, they're hosts, they're newcomers, they're familiars, they're certain. There's all these elements. Uh, you know, maybe we should put the lights over them, then it becomes more distant viewing. You, you have a bigger chance to gather that group. The tables will not be, they come in all sorts of sides size, and shapes and sizes. So that, but of course the, the host, the client will be interested about that. And so what I'm doing is taking crowd modeling and generalizing it to life forces modeling, uh, semi-logical crowds, and you, it's already happening. There's already this kind of thing happening where you can simulate waiting rooms and so on. It's about throughput and efficiency and so on. But I want to be able to communicate with experience, interactive human experience. All the data gathering you can have. And you put cameras there to, to, to understand what the particular culturally specific populations in this zone, institution, and place, on average or in different ways, behave. You can then script particular agents. The important thing is my innovation with an agent modeling is <clears throat> that my agents are, have a whole stack of behaviors 
They're not problem just to run away into, into doors, and through doors and the wrong corridors. They have a whole stack. Depending on what they see, what signals they read, they slow down, become circumspect, or they move fast because they know they're now in the public space, in the private space. They differently behave whether they're... So when they shift the threshold from one space to another, they switch behavioral inscription, behavioral instruction. But out in the public space, somebody would close to you would get away, you would talk to them, you would sit on the park bench probably, you not encounter them. In a more private setting, somebody sits next to you and like them, they have to talk. You have to be totally different, you continuously switch behaviors. So we call it frame-dependent behaviors. And that's the new thing of my crowds. The crowds are frame-dependent and semiologically uh, enhanced crowds, and that's why I can use them to model complex social scenarios, not just evacuation, where you run across, you don't care who owns that space, what's the news, just run out there. What is interesting here is that you can use Maya AI plugins or, or my army and other modeling things where you can make an invent. What is interesting about this is that, that in each patch the behavior is different, and you can encode that, and, and the patches can also move, so you can make that interactive. So these are little models which my students are building. Very simple that you inscribe. Oh, this doesn't it's not fine. They switch behavior as they cross these thresholds. Here they stay and dwell, here they move slowly, here they, they, they accelerate and pull to the edge. So so that's something to make it behave. And, and I'm not sure if these yeah. So you can use them right? and so so basically what is this? The architectural substrate is the order instruction, is the and and the, the overall event designation. We need to build it up out of individual decisions, free agents, so the statistic likelihood of doing this more than that, and you can recreate an event. You don't have to kind of make it like you do now. You create a rendering where you put the people where you want them to be. Right? We go back. We work with individual agent behaviors and. We need to allow our local rules and emerging global pattern be constituted out of individual choices, but just structured choices. And this is also another one where you just structurate the, the space a little bit. And so, so, so towards the edge, you slow down, towards the center, you accelerate, and here you then set an offering, a market, a bar, something like that. There are many of these where we, where we you could leave traces perhaps. Emerging, you, and we, you, you go between modeling and observation, and and, and you can also be quite inventive with rules. You can, in, a, in, a, in a corporate environment, you can actually give scripted rules and, and, and do more than, than would spontaneously be happening. Yeah. So that's the. the um, and also, a little social science. We started doing this from, the, from nearly 15 years ago, and we looked at interaction between objects as a communication, invitation, and reconfiguring the social diagram. And these were, these were at the time not agents, they were key friends, uh, uh, But this is the kind of thing where we develop uh, architecture and its meaning together always. And you can, um, you know, play these things. They're very, very simple initial warming up things and you, you can get the agents to do what they should be doing is sometimes easy, sometimes less easy. And uh, sometimes they are very cool, and not yet working. So you can compare them in different conditions. But, but it's also, you know, it's only walking and sitting down, it's retrospective by definition. Different ways of sitting down, which 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 make communication. Different ways of walking, uh, strolling, schedule, etc. These are nuances of meaning which should really just have repercussions in the in the nuance of the space you articulate. You can also invent new institutions. This is a lecture situation which breaks up into kind of lounging and a mini and rainy and kind of lecture hall. You can imagine it coming and going here in a more stable condition here. And then it's, 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 the ceiling kind of plays with this as well to, 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 to make that a little bit set two thresholds. 
of hinting at that. And you could play nice with light So you can this, you can try to run this and be inventive. You can create um, what I want to show strange and abstract forms which nobody might understand what this is for, what you're doing, what you're trying, and so on. And you can explain to yourself and others what the meaning of these shapes are. And so um, these are the kind of things we work on. Um, this is the kind of missions we, um, we set ourselves and we then make the, 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 the elements interactive as well. So there's this kind of reconfiguration uh, into totally new dynamics, to new situations perhaps, um, while a lot of things remain stable potentially. And then there is the kind of integration of reconfiguration and, and utilization, etc., in, in these animations too. So the, the space gets more done. There's more interaction, more specificity, more variation, more types of audience and event. Uh, 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 allowed for, and so we have created quite a few of those, build up complexity, and um, this is the criteria we now would have usually, or perhaps not physically through put, put for space utilization, but, uh, and, but I think there is uh, also the attempt at the Capacity to operation as a softer social communication criteria, well, encounter frequency, encounter relevancy, interaction diversity, etc. Uh, we can start to draw them out of the model, and um, that's the key innovation for me in terms of location and designation dependent uh, modulated behaviors or specs of behaviors which are selected according to the system of communication. That's the operalization of the semiology. So I have this, all these morphological, this positional, morphological, textual, and color, and lighting, and coding of everything. Now I can, I can read, write a whole novel about this and write endless text into these into legends. That's one way I started to do this. But it's far better to explore the meaning in situ with the agent because that's what the near this. How that agent now modulates where we move from, from across this threshold and, 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 and acquires a new valency and how that creates a, a global uh, configuration. You can let it play out and try it. You can now work on these nuances. You can work and rework. You're actually working on the meaning of social process. You know, working on a drawing, you cumulatively, by line by line, by try and error, you build up a complex geometry. You can coordinate a geometry. You need the drawing. But now we have a, a tool and model of building up the life process, which is a huge step. Imagine before you had drawn what you could build. Very simple symmetrical proportion system. Now with what you can build, it's maybe infinite. Now, before we had this way of understanding what we're trying to design for, we only had a few labels, a few phrases. How primitive. Now what we can work, we can truly work on this, and now we can also instrumentalize all these complex geometries uh, into doing this. So, and I stop here, but let's open the discussion, but I think it's the way forward. I'm done. Get a sophisticated client. 
you need to tease out and understand what they're after. You can help them. We have been in museums, we have been, but we haven't been in, in, in a Google work environment. So, so um, I suspect the, the premise is absolutely right. The, the content, the mission, and the final result is also attributed to the client, so they should be in charge of all of that. And we are, the, the, as you said, we are instrumental. We're making that possible to a new, with a new level of maybe unexpected uh, efficiency, um, pertinence. And we can, of course, also uh, be a, a dialogue if we had done the, what the client also likes sometimes. We've done work for other clients. So they use us also as an information source to see what others have achieved. But they're watching their competitors anyway. So I think we should all, we should, I'm quite happy to see the agency in this, in this way, as you put it, as a much more um, sophisticated and empowering um, hired gun. It shoots much more precisely and, and much more rapidly and, 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 and reload much quicker. So I would say that's, that should be the task. I don't see um, that we have the competency or, in fact, the, um, uh, the right to, 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 to force our agendas beyond that. Uh, but yeah. you, would, you would remember when Zaha won this on the right price to be all in the means to be in Barcelona. Yeah. Zaha was then asked, Okay, now you have to say what was the relation with your work and the means work, right? And then Zaha said, means become to us so important in Ilya Zengri's class at AEA when we start scratching means plans in the Xerox machines. And that was basically before parametrics, before peak as well. And with the peak, you know, the new kind of canon. Now you guys really in, I didn't see the way in three, four years more with the latest research towards parametric semiotics. I think that's incredible jump, you know, from scratching this uh, 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 and this students probably do not understand if you scratch something or do in a in a, in a machine that, uh, uh, except machine that you you don't get any any more Cartesian. But when you, are you, are you arguing here that uh, this should be followed? Uh, I mean, on a kind of general basis, yeah. especially parametric. Yeah, I believe that, and I think that the, uh, the lineages, the, the, there's a lot of consistency in the in the lineages, all the way through the early works. Those intuitions, which were about increased complexity, a space of simultaneity, where many things come into the ground. Contact, inter awareness of spaces, um, a dynamism of an open proposition, etc. Et the contextual embedding of and picking up lines to make connections to, to, to facilitate it. all of this. Now I can speak of it in terms of a life enhancing, um, meaningful, uh, rather than just an intuitive thing. I can rationalize it through an analytic penetration. So, but a lot of the features, but this analytic penetration, of course, then makes this instrumentalized more sharply, and also I can use it to convince myself and others. And so, we've been convincing major, you know, we want a series of major urban planning projects because we can show that, for instance, not start with 100 equal blocks, we start with the whole condition of 100 differential size blocks. And that allows us to tie and pick up streets where they're coming in, and we so our default, we didn't know necessarily what all these hundreds of different works, but we saying they can self-sort into that. We also like, you know, uh, we can tell clients if they don't know already that, you know, not everything is 100% super deterministic in this. You need areas of indeterminacy, right? You need fuzzy logics, you need, you need new spaces which are unarticulated and those sharp. So this, this to allow self-organization. But I think a client like Google would know this, they would have the intuitions. They, they are, our work is already congenial to what the client is calling for. Uh, and we've, I've been looking at, you know, business organization culture, view, and also really view lunch of these concepts, swarms of furniture, kind of keep through reorientation, create different zones, the ones which tilt this way, the density and so on. These field conditions, they already 
I'm looking for them as conditions within the real. They are conditions in the conceptual and, and, and compositional repertoires which we cherish. The music and painting and drawing of throwing um, um, uh, fragments is similar to this garbage school urbanization, which is a condition just better than this, because this was kind of the monotony this morning also could make space. We needed degrees of freedom. So the, the, the project is quite coherent, and, um, and I think there is, of course, uh, um, if we have the intelligent capacity, uh, we can make suggestions and stare at the client. But we, we found that the clients are very sophisticated, and that it's more important that we actually should be congenial to them, that they haven't seen these kind of spaces, but when they see them, they say, yes, that's, that's more what, what, what we, we like. Maybe they've gone to, they, they're looking, browsing old cities and they look for large halls or lofts. So they're looking at a random offering and seeking out and searching certain things, which then uh, we pick up on and systematize and then make a kind of uh, version of it. So it's like you all these kind of retroactive manifestos, you make the principles and re offer them. And you, so, I, so I don't think, uh, I think the intuitions are the right intuitions. We now can individually represent them, and the, and the, I'm totally happy with they being this kind of uh, having all the content, the mission, uh, and this might also be public client. You know, uh, 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 the culture is coming from the client, from the from from from, from what they want to host, and uh, those are usually in our case anyway. And any with new buildings and new ventures and new investments are usually have progressive features because it's the it's, 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 it's a successful, proliferating firm with a new idea which has been catching on, which have the, the resources, the capital, and the, and the guts to go out and do stuff. So new stuff usually has sophisticated, innovative clients. And it's what we have to be as architects, we need to match that. We need to be their sparring partners and congenial guts. I'm totally with this. Uh, and, and I think that uh, that's why my dream client is Google. Yeah, other good clients, <laughs> and I don't expect them to. Uh, I, I can teach them a lot about architecture and the serology of space and spatial organization, but not about how their organization should function. But I know enough, or uh, my intuition is that it's congenial. But they didn't realize the power, the potency of power fully. They find out through trial and error. They have commissioned and made shortlist several times about their new campus, and they had to reject them time and time again. In two hundred years, that's not what we wanted. They had the wrong criteria, select the wrong architect. For instance, they wanted zero carbon. I said, what? Who cares about carbon? You, it's, 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 you want this to become an advertising? You want this to be the, the machine where innovations are produced? Uh, or, you know, was it a PC slogan? But, 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 you know, it can be uh, the right approach. So, so they made this is, so I think they, I never was in front of, face to face with Larry, right? <laughs> That's why I think we don't have a job, right? But now, he's, after several attempts, <laughs> he got something quite close. If you look at the Biaki uh, Thomas um, um, contribution, it's very much in line with what we're trying to do there. And, and we could make it better. So, so, so uh, I'm not sure if it answers your question, or if that you find that very, that I'm so much. Frightening, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, anybody else? Yeah? So, first of all, I think the crowd modeling stuff is very, very cool. Uh, I'm actually not an architect, I'm an algorithmic trader, and I just... You what? I do algorithmic trading, okay, good. and I just come with kind of a data perspective. So I think that it's actually really cool. I'm really glad to see there's finally data being applied to the like modern techniques. How do you trade? you on a trading floor with colleagues? No, no. Um, my group has thousands of computers rolled by the trade automatically. And we okay, basically... Right. But you work somewhere? Uh, yeah, uh, here in China. In a space. Yeah, we have the most. Like, <laughs> Let's talk later. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, over there. No, I have a question. Though. So, okay. Um, so with the crowd models, how do you validate them? So you get gather all this great data I saw with the cameras that analyze it. How do you validate your models against the measurements to make sure that you're simulating the correct things? Okay. Um, there is the, the the element of uh, simulating. Simulation of veracity, yeah. and that you do that when you when you uh, when you make observations, and make observations of crowd behavior of your people in your firm on the campus in the rooms and so on. You, you 
titled up as questionnaires also, who you see, who you like, who you see, and so on. But you can also then observe on the camera what is happening in that foyer, where the people are gathering, where they're sitting, where they're, how long they're staying, so on. And you then try to grasp the underlying rules, the behavioral rules, you try to distill and abstract them, and then you build a model. And the, and the verification comes when, the, when, when you recreate the scene. And there's a kind of pattern predictability and matching, pattern matching of the kind of scenes. So you know that if you can recreate observed conditions in the model, that the model has got the parameters right. It's a good hypothesis. And then you can make manipulations. You change certain things, and then you should, to some extent, you can trust that these interventions, because the rules are still the same, and uh, they, they now react to a new variation of the, of the input, as it were. You can also maybe go back and put, put the intervention into the space and see if that prediction was verified. That's the way you build up the, the, the veracity of the, of, of, of the crowd. But there's, there's also an element of speculative forward uh, researching, where you, where you um, uh, for instance, if you assume that now the built environment, I think it has, it has already spontaneously, through the intuitive intervention of architects, making choices, making this look like a shop and not like an office, making it look like a residence. We always want to make things look like what they are to some extent, but then there's a lot of visual case also. And, but it's very, very really crude categories, not so nuanced. So if we imagine a built environment which has much more information virtually, much more semiotic content and charge, and now we give that information to the, to the agent. So they're much more informed, not only in the nuance of the kind of bar which is coming along. And there's gradients that track and so on, and the light, and what that means. They're much more, they're hoping more, uh, with more assuredness, the, the, the relevance of people gathering and finding a similar place is, is, is enhanced. They're quicker getting from A to B, etc., etc. There's more, and I think you could also hypothesize that, that if you discover that there's more information in the world environment, you look for and make these correlations, form function correlations, and you, you trust that there is a text. If you look at the garbage sheets, you don't even, it doesn't inspire curiosity. If you look at them in intricately ordered, you go, oh, what's that? What's going on? How is this? I want to discover and know it, understand it. Uh, so you have, my, the project is a sense, also something, you bring something new into the world. It's not a little bit better. It's perhaps a much enhanced uh, communication system. And that's speculative. I can't prove this because the current agents are less sensitized to, to semiological clues. They go only go with few categories and don't trust them fully. I want to make a kind of enhanced sensitivity and then see what I get. And I've, I build a whole new set of ambitions into the logic. I introduce negation. I introduce various um, operators' implication. If then, uh, everything but that um, uh, degrees of, 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 of officeness versus residences, etc. So I'm, I'm, I'm increasing the vocabulary richness, the logical categories of information, uh, distant correlations and so on. So and then around the agency model. But, and then I see what, what is possible. I can verify that. It's like a speculative, hypothetical research. If I could pull this off, I could enhance, uh, let's say, um, uh, the vitality of the, of, the, of, the, of the social process by all of the magnitude in a totally new way because now the built environment, the built environment doesn't, doesn't have a negation operator, it doesn't have an implication of or it doesn't have uh, a lot of the um, uh, modalities, for instance. This is necessarily this, this is perhaps that, this is contingently depending on that. So there's also, I'm looking at logic and, and, and the construction of artificial languages, uh, um, which fed into programming language in the same we can, and we can imagine a far more sophisticated spatial visual language uh, than it is, is, exists at the moment, and I can imagine to create a visual language which has more sophistication learns also from verbal language and grammars, which the count doesn't have. Semiotics as a science and analytics is pretty poor because there's no enhanced, upgraded examples in the world yet. 
on sophisticated semiotic system. I uh, wanted to know more about the link between light process models and your parametric design aesthetic because yeah. I feel like those are two completely different paradigms of computational theory. One is on geometry and nerves and splines and squishing and pulling and physical phenomena and physics, really. And then when you talk about like process modeling, it's more about decision making, time, agency of elements and so forth. And I don't see the the link that necessitates, you know, that, that binds them together. What, what I find the most, it's a very good question, but they, <coughs> what I find the striking epiphany I had, I mean, this is I came up with this about two or three years ago, three years ago. And I was like, oh, yes. Because it is a seamless, absolutely seamless, because we've been already, when we're doing building up the, for instance, the earliest model, we start with topography. We, 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 we strip in the flock of houses, different types, the tower floor, semis out, the whole radius block, the roads just run through. Now, the crowns are just one of those subsystems which settle and nestle in. Whether they move or sit, where you're sitting, you just, you know, you can, you can strip the chairs and then you strip the population on top. It's just, these are all intercorrelated subsystems in the same harmonic model. Of course, degrees of freedom in one, but the, but the walls also can wiggle, the lights switch. So they all, in the model, they're absolutely identical. And if you're good at, at if you're good at Miami and Maya, you, you, you construct monsters, furniture, people. I mean, it's all one seamless play of, and in the end, we're all robots of different kinds, of different cognitive capacity. You can't go that far in terms of that. Um, um, so it's very, very seamless. But before we built this, we also used swarm tectonics to 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 to, to emerge flocks of buildings, flocks of shingles on a, on, a, on, a, on a skin, etc. But the difference in, in, in flocks of, of chairs, etc. But they're all one thing, but now I have to realize the important, the one is the purpose of all the other. They're all in the same thing in the model, but my focus needs to be on these bodies and what they're doing. And everything else is just apparatus, it's just cajoling, um, pulling, telling, Forming, uh, um, 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 inviting all this. So there's a, there is the all one thing technologically, but my focus, my design decision making focus, must be only focusing on the on, on, on the crop. That's the driver, the ultimate driver in terms of decision making. Uh, yeah. It's a very good question I've thought about. This. And so, the, some of the, 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 the trick is this that what we have is these abstract grammars. We differentiate the field and we use markers and then we use the, the, the um, let's say, there's a series of buildings, um, the following gradient. Now, the meaning can be reinscribed. And a certain thing that certain uh, notions, um, um, for instance, that I could, I showed through the louver techniques, which, which keep changing shape, whereas north, south, east, west, there's a building in the background which casts shadows, so or thin out the louver. So these things remain, these connections and references remain, even if the meaning changes. Of course, yeah, sometimes if something moves from um, a, a in, in, in a continuous, uh, scripted and coded, more like office environment, somebody moves in and puts an apartment there, and this, but it is behind the office and stuff, and there's a problem. Uh, um, um, so, but, but, so it's not that it is perfect and it's not vulnerable to obsolescence, but maybe you think of, I think it's far less vulnerable to obsolescence than you might think, because a lot of these abstract grammars, which can be re-inscribed with meanings, 
And if, there, if a new population, an evolved population, always self-sorts into it, it will, it will, it will um, uh, self-sort into it with, with its new meaning, a new understanding, and a new, a new encoding. Because it's a relatively abstract grammar of relations and differences and contrasts. And uh, I think if you have a contrast of your central point, it will always attract something of centrality, whether it is, was the bar 15 years ago and, is, and now is the market, and less, if there's a hierarchy there which remains this element of that semiotics, of certain abstract categories and things and relationships remain viable, even though you might have to kind of, yeah, and then there's layers of ephemerality or transience. The, the, the streets network and the physical buildings are more stable, but even there you can reboot, you can close and open, you can reskin, you can relight. I mean, there's there's layers of ephemerality um, uh, which, which 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 address that. And as I said, if, if our, our urban models are not necessarily deterministic in in, in in saying this firm has to be here, this firm has to be here, they just default differentiations where they new self or into and you have maybe sizes of firms from 1 to 100 and they find buildings from 1 to 100 to end up filling themselves in this up. Later firms, other firms, of, if it, uh, will still have that kind of trajectory of, of size and coldness and so on. It's an interesting problem, but I think we might overestimate it because of course there's a tension between a neutral and a kind of determined, a highly articulated condition, which was discussed in models in functionalism versus rationalism. But I like a lot this discourse of the, of the virtual house, for instance, which was a competition house, which was just nearly gratuitous uh, proliferation of forms and differences and strands instead of the neutral. And that has an inspiration to uh, allow us to make different conditions in that res resistance in this case, because it was, a, it was just a, a willful otherness which, which now attracts and allows several something different from here and here and here. So I like that, that so it's not a kind of, um, it's, it's, it allows this openness and, and underdetermining and aleatory uh, appropriation process. So, so the predictability of the, the final meanings is also less. I'm just giving a much more rich and structured substrate of self, of self interpretation here. Of course, if the client has specific briefs and interpretations, I can describe them, that might be. But if they move on and somebody new comes in, I think it's a better matrix to self-sort into that big void with the multiple polycentric void. So if Google moves out and Yahoo moves in or, or whatever, they, they re-inscribe. And it's a better, uh, it, it, in both cases, it's a better fit than the, than the Mies um, block, right? So, 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 and that is also changes meaning, right? It's uh, not the same uh, client, not the same position as city and so on. But it's a very important one.